Hello, everyone. Um, I am excited to be presenting my scholars project. Uh, I've been focused on social learning and independent multi agent reinforcement learning. Um, so, oops. Um, my interest in social learning came uh, through reflection on uh, how it is that I, as a human, have the capacities that I do. Um, so if I had happened to have been born in the woods away from all other humans, I would probably just have like quickly starved to death. But uh, thanks to my ability to tap into cultural knowledge, um, I have the potential to do all sorts of awesome things like participate in a space program or uh, lie in bed all day and browse Twitter. Um, and I think if one were to, if, if one were an alien who just appeared on Earth uh, and saw an example of a human in isolation, I, I think it would be very surprising to see the uh, broad variety that, of behaviors that groups of humans uh, are able to exhibit um, or that individual humans can do if they can tap into that cultural knowledge. Um, so, yeah, um, because of the centrality of uh, social learning to human intelligence, I think it's important to understand the circumstances in which um, social learning can take place. Um, and so in order to uh, sort of experiment with this, uh, there's a cool anecdote from uh, experimental sociology. So basically a group of monkeys were put in a room along with a ladder and some bananas were suspended from the ceiling such that they could be accessed by a monkey who climbed the ladder but were otherwise inaccessible. Well, and Really quickly, do you mind for sharing your slides so that whoops. we get the image you're talking about? Thanks. Uh, yes. My apologies, is that working better? Awesome. Cool. Yeah, so, um, yeah, uh, there's a group of monkeys in a room. They can only reach the bananas using a ladder. And anytime a monkey climbed the ladder to access the bananas, experimenters would uh, spray the rest of the monkeys with cold water. So the other monkeys learned that uh, they should, you know, beat up the monkey that tried to climb the ladder in order to prevent themselves from getting sprayed. Um, and so this behavior persisted even after the monkeys stopped being sprayed with water. Um, and even more interestingly, when new monkeys were introduced into the group, after the water spraying had ceased, the new monkeys, of course, would try to get to the bananas and then the other monkeys would beat them up. Uh, so they would learn not to access the bananas or not to get the bananas, but they would also learn to punish other monkeys that tried to get the bananas. Uh, this became like a cultural phenomenon among the monkeys. Um, so, as it happens, this experiment is apocryphal uh, and did not happen, but um, I think it still serves as an interesting template for how we can try to understand social learning. Um, so, the question I'm interested in answering is that of whether independent reinforcement learning agents can learn from each other um, just by virtue of the fact that they exist in the same environment and can maybe observe one another. Uh, and I think this is an important question because in, as reinforcement learning becomes more capable, it seems likely that there will be many environments in which uh, many reinforcement learning agents might interact. So for instance, uh, stock trading, uh, autonomous and adaptive robots trading stocks in a market. Um, and so it's clearly important uh, to understand the circumstances in which they might learn from one another uh, and exhibit behavior that we might not expect uh, if we were only looking at one of them in isolation. Uh, so I will break my talk down into two parts. First, I'll discuss the tools that I use to approach this question, um, and in particular, the environments and reinforcement learning algorithms that I used. Um, and then I'll talk about some actual experiments about uh, learning from experts. So um, I developed a, uh, an open source grid world implementation called Marl Grid, um, which is, uh, fits the standard OpenAI Gym API. It's easy to extend, uh, so it's easy to put a bunch of 
uh, a large number of agents in the environment, and it's very configurable. And there are also some uh, registered environments uh, so that uh, for reproducibility. Um, and given how obscure this domain is, uh, I, I'm surprised that it's already got a little bit of traction on GitHub. Um, and this is an example of uh, the visualizations that I've built. Uh, these agents are uh, effectively untrained, um, but it's easy to include a lot of them in an environment and visualize what each of them is doing. Uh, and a particular scenario that I spent a lot of time working with, uh, I call goal cycle. So in this environment, there are a number of goal tiles and agents in the environment are rewarded for traversing them in a certain order and they're penalized anytime they mess up that order. Um, and uh, it's, uh, one can uh, experiment with this particular environment, the one that I'm showing here, um, by uh, installing it uh, with a Python package from GitHub. Um, so the, um, th this environment is kind of like an analog to the room with the monkeys. So the reinforcement learning agents that exist in this environment uh, can observe one another uh, and in principle interact with one another. Um, there are a couple uh, interesting things about this environment. Uh, the penalty is configurable and changing the value of the penalty changes the difficulty uh, of learning to explore the environment effectively. When the penalty is low, the agents kind of ignore the uh, penalty incurred by stepping on the tiles out of order. So on the video on the left, the agent um, is not cycling through them in order. Um, and anytime the agent steps on a tile out of order, its color resets to red. When the penalty is very high, um, exploration is costly because uh, the accruing the penalties is aversive and the agents learn to step on the first tile uh, where they get a reward and then they just avoid all of them. Um, so by controlling, again, by controlling the value of this penalty, we can change the difficulty of exploration. And in the context of social learning, we change the difficulty of learning the effective strategy directly from the environment, as opposed to learning it by observing other agents. Um, and then the other big tool was the reinforcement learning algorithms that I used. Um, so I started by implementing DQN, which is like uh, pretty standard for this sort of simple environment. Uh, but I needed to add memory in order for the agents to be able to learn strategies that unfold over the, uh, more than one time step. Um, this didn't work super well, and I spent a lot of effort trying to improve it. Uh, notably, I Im implemented prioritized experience replay, uh, which is kind of tricky with the um, addition of the uh, LSTM. Um, that it still didn't work very well. And I so I implemented PPO and immediately found a pretty uh, big improvement. Um, but further, I found that uh, carrying uh, carrying over the some of the tricks from the RT2 implementation uh, and notably refreshing the hidden states that are collected during the environment over the course of update steps, uh, significantly improved the agent's capacity to use their uh, memories to accomplish tasks. Um, and these diagrams show, or these plots show the difference that it made uh, for a simple goal cycle environment where the agent is learning to traverse the goals. So basically when this trick is applied, uh, the agents are able to uh, achieve much higher rewards and their training is much more stable. Um, so yeah, to recap, uh, a large part of the effort of the project went into developing the reinforcement learning algorithms and environments that uh, allowed agents to effectively learn tasks um, that uh, are amenable to the kind of experiments that I will discuss. So um, revisiting the original question, I'm interested in knowing when independent agents can learn to um, can learn from experts to accomplish uh, tasks or can acquire skills from experts. So what this might look like is uh, we might have a bunch of experts who uh, have a high level of skill and a novice who's introduced to the environment 
uh, initially is very unskillful, but then uh, is able to uh, get to the point of expertise uh, just by observing the experts. Um, and we'd also want it to be the case that the uh, if the novice was alone, they would be unable to learn and their uh, skill would remain low. Um, so there is a paper that um, addresses a question like this called Observational Learning by Reinforcement Learning by Diana Borsa et al. from DeepMind. Um, and in their paper, the experts are hard-coded and novices use RL to accomplish a task in a simple grid world. Um, so the diagram on the top shows like a high, uh, bird's eye view of the map. Uh, the expert in blue uh, optimally travels to a goal, which is which at each episode is placed randomly at one of these 16 positions. And uh, the novice needs to learn to get to the goal as well. Um, here's an image of that, or a video of that. Um, they found that the experts help the novices learn more quickly, uh, but the presence of the experts, um, or even in the presence of the experts, the novices, sorry, the experts don't, cause the novices to do any better uh, ultimately than they would if they were learning alone. Um, so I started by trying to replicate um, the first finding in a uh, simple cluttered grid world, which is like the goal cycle uh, grid worlds I showed earlier, but where there's only one goal. Um, and found that uh, found very convincingly that the presence of experts didn't help the uh, novice agents uh, learn to accomplish their task any more quickly. Um, and the takeaway here is kind of that it's like hard to learn from social cues in these environments. Um, but that doesn't prove that it's impossible. Um, and in order to uh, uh, look in a more targeted way for the circumstances in which this might happen, uh, my effort shifted to different environments, and in particular, the goal, goal cycle environment. Um, so the goal of my experiments has been to construct a scenario where, uh, in contrast to the Borsa results, novices and experts are the same sort of agent, so they're both trained by reinforcement learning, um, where solitary novices struggle to learn, and where the presence of experts helps. Um, and ideally, we'd want the novices to be able to themselves become experts so that we can see that they like have mastered the uh, the skill. Um, and as a bonus, ideally, the uh, whereas in the Borsa case, the uh, the information that the novices get from the experts is uh, or there's not all that much information that the novices can get from the experts because the goal is in like one of 16 places and the novices could just like memorize the potential places. Uh, we want something that looks a bit more like a skill. Um, and so in the we get this in the goal cycle environment because the uh, process of uh, spawning in a new environment and trying out the different possible cycles until identifying the correct one um, is more uh, has, is a closer analog to skill than just like uh, queuing as to uh, which quadrant the goal is in or something like that. So I found that um, when the uh, goal cycles are masked from the view of novice agents, novices do in fact learn to follow experts. And this is uh, consistent with the results from Borsa. Uh, so in both of these videos, uh, both of these videos exhibit this behavior. Uh, the novices are shown in the bottom of the columns on the right. Um, and yeah, in both cases, the novices are doing like a really robust kind of like following behavior. Um, yeah, here the uh, one of the experts happens to have spawned in a, a trap, basically. Um, and in these cases, because the novices is the novices are just following the experts, uh, they end up converging to slightly lower performance uh, than the experts, as you can see in this graph. Um, so the so far the conclusion that I've drawn is that it's like very hard to learn from other uh, to learn from experts. And when it's possible to uh, acquire a skill directly from the environment, uh, it is likely that agents will do that. Um, so in order to uh, 
the next steps for this project, which I'll continue working on, uh, focus on trying to uh, create environments where the social, where the information available from the experts is a uh, more valuable cue as to how to attain a high reward than uh, the information available directly from the environment. Uh, and so I plan to increase the number of goals uh, and uh, experiment with different penalty values and so on. Um, also, the uh, in the example that I showed, the following behavior, uh, while it does help the agent accrue acc more rewards, uh, isn't quite the same skill that the experts are showing. Um, going back to the monkey analogy, we want the uh, novice agents to be doing the same thing that the experts are doing, exhibiting the same skillful behavior. Um, and so a better way to measure that would be by looking at the performance of the agents when they're moved to a new environment without, agent, without experts. Um, and another approach is to add mechanisms to encourage agents to learn socially. Um, it's uh, not clear, for instance, to what degree humans are social learners because of like biological, uh, because they're biologically predisposed to do so, uh, as opposed to because of the uh, environments that they're in. Obviously, by comparing to animals, we might expect the former, um, but yeah, so we can introduce, we can similarly introduce like uh, these priors into agents, and then uh, we can uh, characterize the uh, emergence of the social behavior by varying or turning down uh, that prior. Um, so yeah, I'd like to thank my mentor, Natasha, who's been incredibly supportive and incredibly helpful in uh, both helping me uh, like make the best use of uh, learning resources and helping me engage with the uh, broader AI research community. I'd like to thank the program coordinators, Mariah and Christina, for helping the program go smoothly, uh, even in light of the pandemic. And I'd like to thank uh, my fellow scholars for a lot of incredibly informative discussions and uh, uh, yeah, just generally being extremely supportive. Um, special shout outs to weights and biases for helping me keep track of my experiments and also to uh, Alethea Power for lending me a graphics card that I've been using for some of these experiments. Um, yeah, so now I have time for some questions. Uh, so the first question is, can a novice become more expert than an expert such that other experts learn from it? Um, that's a great question. In the experiments I've been doing, um, the experts continue to learn alongside the novices. Um, so here, for instance, in this plot, the, uh, the experts are still learning, uh, but because in this environment, they happen to be close to optimal, so we don't see much change uh, as they continue to adapt. Uh, but in principle, yes, this could happen. I think another uh, interesting direction uh, is for understanding like social behavior and independent multi-agent reinforcement learning is to uh, carefully study the impact of just like learning in a group, um, which uh, is kind of similar to that. Um, yeah. Cool, so uh, another question is, could you elaborate on hidden state refreshing in your agent? When do you refresh the hidden state and how does it differ from the R2D2 approach? Um, so the agents that I trained, uh, so I trained a lot of the agents with PPO. Uh, with PPO, agents alternate between collecting, experiment, collecting experience in an environment and updating based on that experience. Um, so during the update phase, um, the agents sample their experience and perform a bunch of small updates based on that batch of experience before discarding it at the end of each uh, update. Uh, so the hidden states, um, th so the typical way that the agents, um, or in, in typical PPO LSTM implementations, the agents will save their hidden states as they interact with the environment. So this is like uh, remembering what was in their uh, mind alongside the experiences, and then they will um, sample those as they are doing each of these like little updates. Um, but the 
nature of the experience that they collected depends on the values in the hidden state. And the values in the hidden state depend on their parameters. So as they update the hidden states, um, the, uh, the uh, behavior in their, the behavior that they're learning from becomes less and less representative of the, um, or there's a big divergence between the behavior and their, between the data and their experience um, and the uh, parameters, of the current values of the parameters. So I found that it wasn't too costly to do this. Um, and I uh, have some tweaks to my like LSTM implementation that facilitate this. Um, and in the end, I end up refreshing them uh, basically between each iteration, each gradient step. Uh, and uh, the R2D2 approach differs in a few ways. Um, the reason for those differences, I think, is mainly that uh, the R2D2 approach is off policy. Uh, and so each gradient step uh, has the potential to, or the, the volume of experience that can go into each update is much larger. Uh, and so because of this, they need to employ some tricks to make sure that the um, that the hidden states don't get too stale without refreshing them between each iteration because that would be very costly. But for PPO and on policy reinforcement learning, it like didn't matter too much. Um, another question is, why do you think that proximal policy optimization worked so well? Um, that's a good question. I think, um, Let's see. So I have been thinking a bunch about this, and I think that uh, a lot of it in practice comes from the fact that I uh, my implementation of PPO is based on the spinning up implementation. Uh, and I guess spinning up also deserves a shout out. Um, and it, so it inherited a lot of tweaks that uh, helped uh, help the agent learn stably and perform well. Uh, and it is possible that um, if I, yeah. So I, I hesitate to say that uh, PPO is better than DRQM. Um, that's certainly my experience, but uh, I think I, I inherited a lot of uh, a lot of improvements from the implementation that I based it off of. Um, and then, yeah, the. Hidden state refreshing, I think, uh, is interesting. It is, um, it, yeah, it, it helped immensely with robustness. Um, and yeah, I think the, the reason is that it prevents the policy from making uh, big changes over the course of each update. Um, and this, yeah, helps it, uh, helps ensure that the policy is consistent with the data that it's learning from. Um, I guess uh, I, I would, be interested to for, for some clarification on that question, but um, yeah.